Hi everyone, I'm restoring an IBM PS1 model 2011 and this is part 3, where I'll try to fix the floppy drive that comes with this machine. Here's a quick summary of what you'll see in this video. Inspecting the dead drive, removing bad capacitors and repairing PCB damage, getting the drive working, but then dealing with read errors because of incorrect drive type detection. Finally, adapting a standard floppy drive to be used instead. At the end, I'll see if I can get some programs onto the old hard drive. Let's get into it! In part 1 of this series, I looked at the internals of the base of the computer, otherwise known as the system unit. In part 2, I fixed the DS1287 RTC and CMOS RAM chip, an essential step before getting other components working, including a floppy drive. Before trying to fix or replace the floppy drive, you'll need to make sure you have a working RTC, and hence that you don't get errors 161, 162 or 163 at power on. Typical floppy drive faults include usually one or more of the following. A post error 601 at power on, inability to detect the drive in the configure utility, DOS errors including general failure and not ready, or problems reading and writing disks including sector not found errors. In my case, I power on the machine and despite the floppy drive LED blinking, I get a general failure error in DOS. The drive doesn't even spin up. If I go into the configure utility, the drive is not detected, and sometimes a configuration error appears. Taking the drive out of the machine, I notice a possible problem area where it appears there is some corrosion on the main PCB, near some old surface mount electrolytic capacitors. I'll take the drive apart to inspect for any other telling signs of damage, and try to repair the effects of this corrosion. Aside from any electronic faults, there are delicate mechanical parts in a floppy drive, which can sometimes be dirty, corroded, or otherwise seized up. But in this case, it looks as though things are pretty good. There are some delicate flat flex cables all over the place, and before I can get to the main PCB, I'll use a pair of tweezers with very gentle force to pull the cables out of their connectors. This will then allow me to lift up the PCB on the other side, and easily access it for cleaning and any rework. We see the damaged area of the PCB, where it seems clear that these two electrolytic capacitors have leaked damaging not only the traces in their vicinity, but also possibly affecting some other surrounding parts. I'll need to remove these parts, not only because some will probably need to be replaced, but also because I'll need to make an attempt at cleaning and possibly repairing the underlying PCB. Using my hot air gun, I take each of the surface mount components off. Besides these surface mount capacitors, I'll also need to remove this inductor here, and beside that, another small capacitor. I'll reuse what I can and replace those parts which are faulty. Just to be sure, I'm putting my multimeter into continuity mode, which I can then use as a basic test of the inductor. The fact that it beeps means it's probably good. Taking a closer look at the PCB where we remove these parts, some gunk and corrosion becomes more apparent. So I'm going to use some isopropyl alcohol, or IPA, to clean this area off. Scrubbing for a few minutes will at least take away most of the dirt, and it reveals what appears to be a broken trace. It's likely the capacitor's electrolytic solution has eaten all the way through, between what appears to be a pad and a via. We'll fix this later, but I'll remove the blue trim pot now before doing some stronger cleaning. By using some flux paste and my soldering iron, I will try a gentle chemical clean of the PCB. I picked up some cheap flux paste on Amazon, and I've got a link to it in the description of this video. I don't need to be too cautious here, so I'm just using a toothpick to apply the flux paste liberally to the main problem areas before I dose up my soldering iron with some solder, and hold it at a low angle to wash across the area where we earlier removed the parts. The hot flux helps clean the solder pads, while the solder freshens the pads to help with reattaching the components later. Solder wick, also known as desoldering braid, can also be found on Amazon. Check the video description for a link. It helps round off the cleaning by soaking up excess solder, leaving us with nice even pads, and ensuring we haven't introduced unintentional shorts. Fixing the severed trace is hopefully a simple matter of scratching off some of the green solder mask, and then bridging the trace and via. A little dab of solder across the two should do the trick, and a continuity test will help verify. I earlier traced where the via connects up with another part of the board, and the beep from my multimeter in continuity mode proves these two points are now reconnected. Now it's time to replace the components we earlier removed. I have these surface mount capacitors rated at 10 microfarads and 16 volts, which makes them equivalent to the failed metal can electrolytics that we removed. Even though this SMD footprint isn't an exact match at 6032 metric, or 2412 imperial, I think we can get them to fit. 
Note that the grey stripe at one end marks the positive pin. We can give one capacitor terminal a generous dab of solder, while the sticky residual flux paste helps hold the part in place. Capillary action flows solder between the terminal and PCB pad, giving a good bond to secure the capacitor, so that we can then solder the other side of it and touch up both sides if needed. I then repeat this process with the other replacement capacitor, and the remaining parts that I think are good enough to reuse. First the inductor with a very similar footprint, and then the smaller ceramic capacitor beside it. More continuity tests are wise after rework like this, to check for proper joins but also to rule out any shorts. Finally it's time to replace the through hole trim pot, and then I carry on with a close inspection of my work. This might not be perfect, and I could use IPA to clean up the residual flux, but hopefully this is going to be good enough to get this drive working again. I reassemble the drive, being careful to securely but gently reinsert those flat flex connectors. I'm hopeful that this electronic repair job will do the trick, and the PS1 system will at least detect the drive now, though there is still the possibility of other issues such as mechanical failures. With the drive plugged in and for now just resting on top of the PS1 chassis, I power on the machine without a floppy disk inserted yet, and hopefully the machine will still boot normally. It's a good sign that we don't see any magic smoke, at least. So far so good. I've still got a keyboard error to sort out another day, but we can see the PS1 boots into the 4 quad screen as usual. So let's go to a DOS prompt and see if the machine can detect the floppy drive now. I run the configure command, and things start to look promising. Floppy drive A has now been detected, and it is showing as a 1.44 megabyte 3.5 inch drive, which is correct. So hopefully now we might be able to access it. Exiting the configure utility, I'm going to try accessing drive A, but first without a floppy disk inserted. Though it takes a little bit of time to respond, we do get this predictable not ready reading drive A, which is the error you would normally expect if a floppy disk wasn't yet inserted. So let's abort that and insert a floppy disk which I tested in another machine earlier and give it another shot. Trying to access drive A again, unfortunately it doesn't respond the way I would expect, where again we get the same not ready reading drive A. It does occur to me that maybe the system has only successfully updated CMOS RAM for the first time since I ran the configure command, and so maybe a power cycle is needed before the drive will work properly. Otherwise, if a replacement drive is needed, note that using a standard floppy drive in this PS1 will require a cable modification. I'm a little confused by a CMOS error 162, warning us of a detected hardware change or configuration error. We'll come back to see why this is important later. For now, I've gone back into DOS, and put the disk in, and again I try to access drive A. And it looks like things might be working now. We can see the contents of the disk, which seems to include files for a Typing Tutor program. Having a look around, I see an executable called tl.exe. So I try running that, but as it tries to load, we get a sector not found error. I already verified this disk in another machine earlier, so what's going on now? The check disk command shows nothing odd, so I try testing a write to the disk by first creating a directory, and then typing some text into a new file by using the copy con or copy from console command syntax. After banging out some text that I want written into a new file, I hit Ctrl Z and enter to signal that I'm done. The file appears to write to the disk OK, and reading it back is successful, so at least something is working right. I was confused earlier about a post error 162 indicating a configuration error, which got me wondering about the CMOS settings. When I next powered the machine back on, I went into the configure command, and noticed this oddity. The system has indeed found what it thinks is a configuration error, because the floppy drive is now detected as a 1.2 megabyte 5 and a quarter inch model not 1.44 megabytes 3.5. This seems to be the cause of the sector not found error. I found the system would intermittently switch between detecting the drive as 1.2 megabytes and 1.44 megabytes, but why? PS1 and certain PS2 floppy drives are unique in that they have a drive identity signal on pin 4, while standard floppy drives leave pin 4 unconnected. From the system unit's perspective, if this pin is pulled to ground, the drive should be 3.5 inch and 1.44 megabytes. Suspecting a fault with pin 4 on my drive, 
I set about soldering up a simple pass-through adapter that just singles out pin 4 on the motherboard side and connects it directly to ground, but this didn't seem to make much difference. I only later discovered the problem seemed to be caused by the keyboard of all things. There are bad capacitors in my keyboard that cause a glitch if the keyboard is plugged in when the PS1 is being turned on, leading to the keyboard malfunctioning and endless beeping at the post screen. This also seems to be enough to upset the motherboard's logic that senses the drive type. I've found that if I leave the keyboard unplugged when powering on, and then plug it in afterwards, the keyboard works normally and so does the floppy drive. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep pin 4 grounded just in case. If you find you have to replace your PS1 floppy drive, you can use a standard PC floppy drive or GoTek floppy emulator instead, but some cable modification is essential, because while the cable pinouts are very similar, there is also one small but critical difference. The standard 4-pin floppy drive power connector, often called a Berg connector, supplies 5 volts and 12 volts to power a standard PC floppy drive. PS1 drives, however, don't have this. Instead, the power lines are part of the main 34-way ribbon cable. Connecting this directly to a standard floppy drive will not work, and in fact it will likely cause electrical damage, because of the extra power lines on pins 3 and 6 that a standard floppy drive otherwise expects to be grounded. What we need to do if we want to use a standard floppy drive is make cable modifications or an interface adapter to reroute the PS1's integrated floppy power lines to the power connector of the standard floppy drive. We also need to connect the PS1's pin 4, or identity pin, to ground so that the PS1 properly detects a 1.44 MB 3.5 inch drive. Aside from maybe wiring up your own adapter as shown, you can do this by modifying the PS1's floppy cable, or any other straight through non-twisted floppy cable. Only a few small cuts and new connections will be required. In my case however, I had a small adapter board made. I ordered a simple PCB that I designed in KiCad and assembled it by hand. For this, I needed a socket, specifically a 0.1 inch pitch female double row header socket, cut down to 17 pins a side for 34 pins total. Likewise, a male double row pin header, and a female Berg connector, although four female jumper wires would probably also be fine. There are several ways you can make an adapter like this without having to get a printed circuit board made. Given that all pins on one side are ground, except for the 5 volt supply on pin 3, it can be fairly easy to make an adapter on prototyping board, or Vera board, also known as strip board. I'm happy with this board however, and making sure I have it the right way up, I put down something insulating over the motherboard, and attach it to the PS1's floppy cable. At first, I want to try powering on the PS1 without a floppy attached, because I want to be sure that there are no shorts, and then I do a test to make sure I see approximately 5 volts and 12 volts where expected, on a couple of test points. This seems about right, so after I power off the machine, I plug the other end of the adapter board into the standard floppy drive, and plug the Berg connector into the power input of the drive. For now, I'll rest the drive on top of the chassis before powering the machine back on. On this occasion, I had bad CMOS settings from prior tests, which is what led to post error 162 again, but I have learned to leave the keyboard unplugged early in the power on. After ignoring these errors and going back into DOS, Configure shows us that it wants to update the bad CMOS settings with a correctly detected 1.44 MB 3.5 inch drive. So we hit enter to save the settings, and now, after another reboot, I can go in and access drive A, and it lets me see the contents of the disk. I can also correctly run the tl.exe program that was previously failing with a sector not found error. Now that this drive is working, I could reassemble this PS1, but just note that the face of these two drives isn't exactly the same. So in my case, I would just leave the front cover off the PS1 while I continue to work on the machine, but some people make adjustments to their replacement drive for a better fit by taking off the faceplate and 3D printing a more authentic looking eject button. In any case, now that I've got a working drive solution, I've been able to copy some games to the hard drive of this old PS1 and relive some nostalgic gaming experiences, including classics like Lemmings, Prince of Persia, Gods, and Wolfenstein 3D at a bit of a crawl, and get a load of that classic PC speaker sound too. In a future episode I will see if there's something that can be done to improve on that. 
But first I might tackle the keyboard situation to try cleaning it up, and perhaps fix those faulty capacitors. So that's it for this video. This is the point at which I'd love it if you subscribe to my channel. If you've got any questions, feedback or advice, please leave a comment. A thumbs up will go far to reaching more viewers and encouraging me to make more videos, not only about this machine, but other retro hardware and tech hobbies. Thank you again for watching, and see you next time.